Good evening. I'm Sandy O of Emma's Revolution. And I'm Pat Humphreys. We're so honored to be here for the 2021 Kiplinger Lecture on Ethics in America. If there was ever a time for a focus on ethics in this country, it would be now. And we are so grateful to Representative Jamie Raskin for his courage and leadership. And though Sandy and I live in California, now we're still proud of all of the work that the representative has done and continues to do in all of our names. And we're grateful to Reverend Abi and the Cedar Lane community for all of the wonderful justice work that you do. Thanks again for having us. Our people gonna rise. Our people gonna rise. Our people gonna rise. Listen to our cries through the pain and lies. Our people gonna rise. Our people gonna sing. Our people gonna sing. Our people gonna sing. In spite of Thank you, Emma's Revolution. Good evening. Good evening. Let's try that again. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Church. I'm the Reverend Abhi Janamanchi. My pronouns are he, him, and I serve as Cedar Lane's senior minister. Please know that whoever you are, whomever you love, Wherever you're from and wherever you're joining us from tonight, whomever and wherever your journey is leading, despite your life circumstance, whatever your gender identity, immigration status, or political affiliation, we welcome you to Cedar Lane. If you're joining us online, please share in the chat your name and where you're joining us from. We're so glad you're here with us tonight. And if this is your first time in a Unitarian Universalist setting, we want you to know that Unitarian Universalism is a practical, covenantal, democratic, and prophetic faith. We are practical in that our religious practice grows as we grow in our understanding and in our taking responsibility for where our religion takes us. Unitarian Universalism is a covenantal faith as it is based on a series of promises that we make and remake to one another about how we will be together in community. And central to our promises is our willingness to accept the fact that we will make mistakes and that our faith is that we can be forgiven for those mistakes and our trust that we can always move one step closer to the beloved community. And the use of the democratic process in our congregations and in society at large is a fundamental ethical and spiritual principle for Unitarian Universalists. We believe that every voice and every vote matters and that a functioning democracy is one where all voices, including black, brown, indigenous, 
poor, low income, and those that have been marginalized for generations are heard equally, and where public interest and the common good guide our decision making. Our faith calls us to protect voting rights everywhere and to resist attacks on democracy. And finally, ours is a prophetic faith as it enjoins us to engage in the deeper and more difficult work of dismantling structures and policies that promote inequity and injustice and advocate for policies and actions that are fair, just, and equitable to live into being the vision of the beloved community that is grounded in love. That in a nutshell, is who we are and what we seek to be. And it is my delight to be joining all of you in welcoming our 2021 Kiplinger Lecturer, who will be introduced in a little while. And before we do, I'd like to welcome the chair of our Kip Kiplinger Lecture team, David Devlin Foles, to share a few words about the Kiplinger team and the Kiplinger work. Thank you, Reverend Abbe, and welcome everyone. Let me first recognize the members of, the C of Cedar Lane who serve on the Kiplinger Lecture Team. Diane Belanger, Peggy Jackson, Coral Mumby, Ralph Petersberger, Paul Richter, and Sue Woodruff. It's been our privilege to organize this year's Kiplinger Lecture with tremendous help from the Cedar Lane staff. The Kiplinger Lecture on ethics in American society is now in its 21st year, and it was made possible by a generous grant from the Kiplinger Foundation in memory of Willard M. Kiplinger, an early member of Cedar Lane and the founder of the Kiplinger Washington Letter. This annual lecture aims to promote a deeper understanding of ethics and morality and to move individuals to apply that understanding in their lives. Members of the Kiplinger family are tuned into today's uh, lecture, and I want to say again how grateful we are at Cedar Lane for the gifts that have made this program possible. It's now my pleasure to introduce Rich Maddalino, the Chief Administrative Officer of Montgomery County, Maryland, a former Maryland State Senator, and now, most importantly, a trustee of Cedar Lane Unitarian Universalist Church, we call on Rich to welcome our 2021 Kiplinger lecturer, his friend and former colleague, Representative Jamie Raskin. Rich, come on up. I don't think anyone has uh, put the emphasis on chief administrative <laughs> officer before like that. I, I might have to start pronouncing it myself that way. So um, David, thank you for that introduction. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to introduce my friend, uh, Jamie Raskin. So um, I met Jamie in 2006 when we were first elected together um, to the Maryland State Senate and I had the um, the good fortune to be um, assigned to park next to him in the Senate garage. And we, and we had our two minivans from Montgomery County to, to, to park together. And then we wound up actually um, seated together next to each other on the, the floor of the State Senate. So I used to um, fondly call Jamie my work spouse because certainly for the 90 days of the legislative session, I spent far more time with him than um, we spent with either one of our, uh, of our spouses. But um, we were partners in getting so many things accomplished in the state of Maryland. And it's hard, it's hard to think back and really put uh, a tally together about all of the things that were accomplished when Jamie got into the State Senate and changed the DNA of the whole organization, eliminating the death penalty, passing the DREAM Act, passing marriage equality for same gender couples, adding gender identity to the state's anti-discrimination code, meaningful gun violence prevention legislation. We took steps 
in Maryland, thanks to Jamie's leadership after the horrific um, murders in Sandy Hook, Connecticut, when um, so many other states and Congress failed to act, we actually passed um, groundbreaking legislation that Jamie fought very hard um, for. So uh, Jamie's also a person you're just proud to have as a friend um, because he is so caring, so curious, so interested in, in your life. You really do feel with, when you're with Jamie um, you're the most important person um, in the world. It is a, a remarkable feat. Before joining the Senate, before joining Congress, he was a constitutional law professor for 25 years at American University. Um, you know, when Jamie was elected uh, in 2016 to Congress, um, I remember thinking all of the good things that happened that night and the one really, really bad thing that happened. But um, I think I said to Jamie when he had a, a party um, in Silver Spring, there was no one better suited for that moment in time to join the United States House of Representatives than Jamie Raskin. And... <laughs> And we definitely saw that um, when Jamie stood up to the Trump administration from day one. Um, I remember Jamie being the first one to, to, to um, deliver the line about Trump's inaugural address that it was better in the original Russian. Um, so, and, and, and I, remember, I remember him, him, you know, Jamie has a way with words and starting a chant and it was, um, it was, uh, oh, emoluments. I'm trying to think of the chant Stop that went, Trump. Stop, Stop Trump, Stop Pence, impeach them for emoluments. <laughs> so, so that's, so someone dared him to rhyme, come up a chant that, that had um, emoluments in it. So, um, but, you know, Jamie distinguished ourself, our community, and he, protected our Constitution when he, he stood up in the darkest of moments and led the fight, the noble fight, to impeach Donald Trump the second time around for, um, for uh, his efforts to undermine our Constitution on January 6th and the whole, everything that went on in the post-election um, period. And it was because of Jamie's arguments, his passion, his well-thought-out approach to, um, to the impeachment that he got more votes of the Republican Party to impeach a president than any other Republican president has ever been impeached with. So um, I, I know, when you think about all the Republicans we've had to impeach, um, Jamie was the most successful floor leader um, in, a, in American history as far as getting actual um, a bipartisan vote. So um, I do want to take a moment to introduce, before we bring Jamie up, our good friend Al Carr, a delegate from this district, District 18, and a member of Cedar Lane, and a, and a, and a good friend of Jamie's as well. And um, with that, uh, I am so pleased to introduce my good friend and our amazing United States House of Representative member for District 8, Jamie Raskin. Uh, thank you, dear um, Senator Madalino, Chief Madalino. Uh, you're making me nostalgic for the days when um, um, I didn't have to deal with the filibuster. Uh, and we got stuff done all the time. And uh, um, I will treasure those glory days, and we will we'll get back to them soon. But thank you, Rich Madalino, for your extraordinary devotion to our community and to public service. Uh, you're, you're a model to me for what a public servant is. And uh, thank you, Al Carr, for coming out a great delegate, a great leader for uh, District 18. Uh, so delighted to see you too. Um, thanks to all of you guys for being here tonight. 
Uh, I want to thank uh, Reverend Abby. I want to thank the Kiplinger family. I want to thank uh, David, Devlin Foltz. Um, I want to thank uh, Emma's Revolution. I did not realize that they had um, defected to California. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, I'm thrilled that they're still engaged with, um, with Cedar Lane and with our community. And uh, we, we love, we treasure Emma's Revolution. Uh, thank you, Senator Madalino. Thank you, Delegate Carr. Uh, thanks to all my friends here at Cedar Lane, not only for inviting me to give the uh, Kiplinger lecture, but for constantly challenging me to remember and to re-articulate my, my deepest uh, spiritual and intellectual values. So I very much appreciate that. As you know, I spend most of my time these days defending democratic institutions and practices and values against coups, insurrections, corruption, um, and trying to advance the common good by passing the Infrastructure Act, which we did do. Um, <clears throat> uh, and uh, passing the Build Back Better Act, which I hope we will do next week, and uh, working to reduce airplane noise and all of these things. So. I welcome, even if I somewhat fear the opportunity to approach uh, the daunting philosophical subject we have agreed upon for the evening, which is an ethical reading of the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the future of American democracy. Um, so um, I, uh, I, I got to say that I, um, I'm invited to talk all over the place in our district of course, in Montgomery and Frederick and Carroll County. And um, I'm invited here to Cedar Lane uh, frequently. Whenever I can get an invitation, I come back. But um, I am never invited to give a lecture with a capital L. And this has made me nervous for like the last two weeks um, because you know, I've spent enough time in academia to know what a lecture is. And uh, the Kiplinger family is probably out there watching some place, somebody endowed this. Um, I hope the money's going back into Cedar Lane or some, uh, some good cause. Um, and it's a, a formal thing. So I actually wrote out a speech for you guys just because it was a lecture. If you just invited me to talk, I would have just shown up. But um, I've actually, uh, I've put some systematic thought uh, into this for all of you. Um, and of course, somebody today, uh, invited me to do something. I said I couldn't. Uh, they said, why not? I said, I'm going over to Cedar Lane to talk about um, ethics and the Constitution. Um, and she said, you're preaching to the choir. I said, I like preaching to the choir, OK? The choir needs to be preached to also. Um, so um, all right, I so I start with the question of what is an ethical reading anyway? What do we mean? when we say we're gonna give an ethical reading to something, and I suppose that depends upon our conception of what ethics is. We are often invited to think of ethics as a system of rule following, like the rules of professional responsibility that we have in the bar, or the ethical rules governing uh, doctors, or um, plumbers, or other trades, or uh, professions, and um, this is not exactly wrong in its most reductionist form, but I do think that this sterile conception of ethics leaves out a lot, like society and culture and moral striving and political struggle and really the history of everything that's ever happened. And here I would contrast uh, a conception of passive justice with a conception of active justice. And passive justice is indeed trying to follow the rules as they've been written and embodied into some kind of ethical code. But active justice requires us to test systems of rule following against morality and the evolving conceptions we have of what justice requires. So for me, ethics is a program of action, both individual and collective that addresses and combats social vices, specifically vices like war 
and violence against innocence, corruption, injustice, and what Montaigne called the ordinary vices of human society. And I want to pause here for a second to uh, invoke the work of Montaigne um, in an extraordinary essay called Of the Cannibals. Montaigne discussed the ceremonies of the Tupanamba people in Brazil. And he favorably contrasted the widely denounced cannibalism of this tribe with what he called the barbarianism of French civilization. And of course, he's writing in the early 1600s, around the same time as Shakespeare was writing. And Montaigne in this essay points out that everyone in the civilized world in the 16th century loves to denounce the cannibals. But he pointed out that the cannibals that the French anthropologists had gone to study and came back to report about had killed only a few hundred people a year in combat and then ate them for protein. But he said the advanced and civilized nations of France and England slaughtered hundreds of thousands of people in the wars of religion between the Catholics and the Protestants in Europe. And in those bloody wars of religion, the victors did not even eat their victims, letting all that protein go to waste, <laughs> while hundreds of thousands of corpses lay on the field. And this, Montaigne said, was not even to mention what he called the ordinary vices of civilization, adding parenthetically that these ordinary vices were hypocrisy, snobbery, cruelty, betrayal, and misanthropy. So I've been given permission by Reverend Abi uh, to pause to address a Socratic question to the audience, because you can take the law professor out of the classroom, but... Uh, uh, so, but what I want to ask you is, in thinking about these five ordinary vices, um, hypocrisy, snobbery, cruelty, betrayal, and misanthropy, which do you think is the worst of the ordinary vices? And I'll give you a second to think about that, and then I'm going to, I don't have a seating chart, but I'll call on somebody. Uh, <laughs> I'll relive my glory days as a law professor. Does anybody have a, a reaction to this? All right, who said hypocrisy? Mark? David, that's you? All right, stand and make your case if you would. Uh, <laughs> well, David says that hypocrisy is the worst of the ordinary vices. So first define what you think hypocrisy means and then tell us why you think it's the worst. Hypocrisy is hypocrisy taking one thing and doing it Although at this moment, I've got to follow the other so David makes a strong case. Uh, he says that hypocrisy is stating one thing as a principle or an ideal and then doing another. Um, and hypocrisy is the vice that makes all other vices possible. All right, let me just quiz you on that for a second. Uh, is it true that hypocrisy makes all the other vices possible? I mean, there are lots of um, savage murderers in uh, history who weren't hypocrites. I mean, Mussolini and Hitler were never called hypocrites. They told you precisely what they planned to do and then they did it, right? And um, so is hypocrisy really the worst? Um, I mean, you're right that it is often used as a tool to make other other vicious actions possible, but um, I wonder about it. There, um, there's no doubt that hypocrisy is maddening to people. When I go to the House floor, generally what I'm hearing about is asserted hypocrisy. You know, how can Nancy Pelosi eat, you know, $7 ice cream and claim she cares about the poor, you know? Um, and it's occurred to me recently that there's a very easy way, of course, to 
get rid of hypocrisy, which is just to have no ideals at all. If there's no ideals, then nobody's betraying their ideals. Nobody's failing to live up to them. So maybe hypocrisy is not the worst. I think you're right that it, it's part of the arsenal of uh, the, the most vicious um, enemies of truth, certainly, and justice. Who, who, anybody else have another candidate? Yes. Is that Deborah? Cruelty, okay, and what's your argument? Yeah, so, so Deborah, Deborah's candidate is cruelty, the deliberate infliction of pain, suffering on uh, another person or an animal perhaps even, uh, without any compunction, without any purpose. All right, so let's hold that thought for a second. Is there anybody else who wanted to make the case for betrayal, snobbery, misanthropy? Yes, in the back, there's two. Let's hear from both of you guys. I'm sorry, I can't see who that is. Well, the first part of that was very compelling, but I, I didn't hear the rest of it. Um, it, gotcha. Okay, so, so the suggestion is snobbery is the worst because by elevating yourself above others and making uh, difference sting and hurt, um, Again, it enables all other kinds of, of viciousness. But there was one other hand back there. Were you going to say the same thing? So we, we had two votes for snobbery. Let's do one more here. Um, so I haven't looked it up because I didn't know what to stop. Can I give you a fight? Hatred of mankind. Yes. And all of the others are forms of misop. All right, so the, the, the argument for misanthropy, which is the hatred of all humanity, um, makes possible all these other depredations uh, and pervades them. Was there one other one? I thought I saw one other hand back there. Who's, yeah, yes, ma'am. Yes. Okay, so, so I think we've gotten them all now. So tell us about betrayal. So. Hello? All of these others are definitely bad, but betrayal is an act. Yes. You can be a snob, but you can be a snob by yourself. You can be a passive snob. You could. You can barricade you can yourself. You can hate mankind, in. but you could be off in the mountains. So, so there's arguments. Uh, let's just pause there because those are great points. I mean, the argument against snobbery is, well, yes, snobbery can make it possible for people to become cruel, but there are also people who are just snobs who barricade themselves into a country club or whatever and you never see them again. Um, and so there, there might be more innocuous forms of snobbery, even though we know it can become dangerous. And I think you were making the point about misanthropy. There are misanthropes, clearly, who become a danger to everybody else, but there are also misanthropes who become recluses, right? Um, I mean, some will turn into a dictator or the Unabomber or something, but some misanthropes uh, just can't deal with all of the vices of humanity and they hide away. Some, there, there's even a positive argument to be made for misanthropy that sometimes you get artists or actors or comedians or what have you, you know. So, but so tell us about betrayal, if you don't, if complete the argument for betrayal. Betrayal is, is a decision that the person makes to hurt another who has trusted them. Yeah. And that's, that's unforgivable. Yeah. And betrayal definitely resonates with a, a very deep, almost childhood sense of abandonment and desertion uh, that is very painful to people. Um, my professor, who was a, a big Montaigne person, her name is Judith Schlar, who introduced me to this essay, 
into this kind of moral taxonomy. She said that the, the ambiguity of betrayal, of course, is that all of us are caught up in a web of competing loyalties and allegiances, and so you never know um, when you may be betraying someone by accident, right? Because people build up expectations. She, she often gave the example of uh, Robert E. Lee, who was, you know, the commander at West Point. He was the head of the Union Army. Lincoln wanted him to be the head of the Union Army during the Civil War, and he was torn between sticking with the Union and going with Virginia and his family and his friends. And of course, he's lionized today in some quarters as, uh, as a hero, while in others he's seen as a traitor. Um, and that kind of confusion about betrayal, I think, uh, does suffuse a lot of public life and private life too. I mean, think about bad breakups in relationships or marriages where half the people think so-and-so was at fault and half the people think the other person is at fault and you just don't know. And it's, you know, so subjectively interpreted. So let me just uh, bring it back to Deborah's point about cruelty. Um, the, but, so Professor Schklar uh, made the argument that made a huge impact on my thinking that liberalism, which I always thought was kind of the product of political philosophers like John Locke or John Stuart Mill or Jean-Jacques Rousseau or John Rawls, you know, someone who came up with a big theory and deduced all these things, in fact is not the product of big fancy theories and meta principles from which everything is deduced. Liberalism is the result of movements for moral and social reform targeting cruelty and a revulsion against cruelty that grows up in the 18th and 19th centuries um, in movements like abolitionism of slavery, uh, movements to prevent uh, cruelty to children, to abolish child labor laws, to improve the situation in sweatshops, to protect animals and so on, that these movements were actually um, the movements that transformed society to uplift the consciousness of humanity by putting cruelty first and making cruelty um, the principal evil at which both social movements and government needs to aim to try and reduce. So, I raise that um, because, to my mind, um, this elevation of cruelty over the other vices as the enemy of democratic liberalism gives us the template for evaluating um, both the astounding successes and the dramatic limitations of our Declaration of Independence and our Constitution. The Declaration, adopted unanimously by the Second Continental Congress, uh, Congress on the 4th of July, 1776, proclaimed the essential principles that have guided our experiment in democratic self-government and have informed democratic revolutions and constitutions uh, around the world. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive to these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and their happiness. So there it is, human, civic, and political equality, right there as a founding principle, unalienable individual rights, the consent of the governed as the basis for democratic legitimacy, the democratic rights of peoples to practice self-government under the rule of law and to overthrow oppression. And yet, the Bill of Particulars leveled against King George in the Parliament while correctly setting forth the multiple assaults on freedom and democracy endured by the colonists 
such as dissolution of the colonial legislatures, imposition of royal uh, judges, and other recurring ravages against the rule of law, also revealed the bloody dark side of our Enlightenment Declaration of Independence. For among the complaints lodged against King George um, were that he had excited domestic insurrections against us, which has been interpreted to mean slave rebellions, and endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. So with shades of Montaigne and um, the cannibals in the passage, the declaration projects onto enslaved human beings and Native American Indians targeted for genocide all of the savage violence that was actually trained against them by the colonists. So we must confront in our age, and we are confronting in our age, the paradox that the great intellectual and political progress proclaimed and initiated by the Declaration of Independence forged not at the beginning a universal democratic republic, but a slave republic of Christian white male property owners over the age of 21. All of the contradictions of the founding period would come back to haunt us in the Civil War and the wrenching struggles over racism and white supremacy that continue to this very day. But what can we say for Thomas Jefferson, the author of the Declaration, a Renaissance man, a scientist, a botanist, a political philosopher, and a slave master who owned 600 human beings, a man who embodied all of the terrible contradictions at our founding. We cannot excuse him, as some may try to do, simply by saying that he was a creature and product of his time, because there were other contemporaries of Jefferson, founders like Ben Franklin, and my favorite, the great Tom Paine, and even Alexander Hamilton, who were abolitionists, even at the time of the American Revolution. What we can say for Jefferson, who knew that slavery was a crime against humanity and stated that I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, is that he was a deeply flawed man, but one who successfully inscribed the general principles of freedom, equality, and democratic self-government into the declaration that subsequent generations of Americans, of all races and classes, um, could come to use to argue for expansion of the circle of democracy and of the meanings of the American experiment. He built the republic on a solid theoretical foundation even if he participated in resting it on very dangerous pillars of white supremacy and slavery. Um, now, the Constitution started out with three beautiful and glorious words, we the people. Um, and that opening phrase capsized the entire history of political thought up until that point because in the age of monarchs, kings and queens and royals, it was of course thought that all power began with God and then it flowed to the kings and queens who could explain exactly what God intended for society, and then from the kings and queens it went to the nobles, the church, and then finally at the very bottom you get to the common people, uh, to the rabble. And our framers at Philadelphia turned the whole thing upside down and began with we the people. Um, and we made the question of God and religion um, a point of faith, of personal worship and personal decision-making rather than something to be dictated by the government. Um, the Constitution, however, as an ethical document, is even more compromised than the Declaration of Independence was by the explicit political and juridical compromises made with the so-called slave power, the power of the slave masters. 
um, and I'm thinking of the Fugitive Slave Clause, the permission for importation of enslaved human beings until 1808, um, and of course, the infamous Three-Fifths Clause, which dramatically increased the political power of the slave masters in both the legislative and executive branches of government. Um, oftentimes, we think that um, it was the southern states that insisted upon the Three-Fifths Clause um, when, in fact, it was the North that argued for it. Because the question was, should the enslaved population be counted for the purposes of uh, census reapportionment and then uh, redistricting the allocation of U.S. House seats? And for these purposes, and these purposes only, the slave master said, yes, of course they should be counted. They wanted every slave to be counted to inflate the population base for determining how many representatives would be awarded to the southern states. And the northern, uh, the anti-slavery and the northern interest said, no, um, if these people are not going to be allowed to vote and to participate, they shouldn't be counted. And they went back and forth and then settled on three-fifths, which meant that 60% of the slave population was counted in the census for the purposes of determining um, how many representatives would be counted in uh, or would be awarded to the southern states. And in the election of 1800, where the southern states did go with Thomas Jefferson against John Adams, there um, were an additional 12 representatives elected from uh, the southern states because of the three-fifths compromise and an additional dozen electoral college votes that Jefferson collected because, of course, the electors are the number of representatives plus two for each of the states. So the Constitution was really gerrymandered from the very beginning in the interest of the slave power. Four of our five first presidents were slave masters who brought slaves with them uh, into the presidency. Seven of our first 10 presidents were slave masters for the same reason. And even all the way through today, although I don't have time to get into it right now, the Electoral College has a pronounced southern tilt to it. Um, so, um, so that fatal compromise was built in from the beginning. But we can also recognize in our Constitution that there were great ethical leaps forward made when you think about the entire history of humanity. The central leap was in the context of the separation of powers, a broad concept that encompasses what may have been the single greatest structural breakthrough in the creation of the new constitution, the separation of church and state, the division of secular governmental power from ecclesiastical church religious power. Um, our framers were uh, enlightenment radicals who rebelled against centuries of religious wars, theocracy, um, holy crusades, inquisition, witchcraft trials, and other forms of religious authoritarianism and oppression, all accomplished with the help of state power. And none of them, I should add quickly, in the name of the Unitarians or the Universalists. Uh, um, the, the First Amendment banned establishment of religion and it protected the free exercise of religion, and it unified those two principles. Sometimes they're characterized as being in tension with each other, but in fact, they go very much together. Because if a religion is allowed to establish itself over everyone else, then of course it will stifle the free exercise of other people's religion. So if you want to have free exercise of religion, you've got to make sure that the government is not taking sides and dictating to people of religious orthodoxy. Um, and this has been um, a hard-won principle in American life, but the Supreme Court up until very recently has been moving in the direction of really strongly defending the separation of church and state. Uh, one critical decision you probably remember in 1962 was Engel versus Vitale, which said that uh, public schools could not engage um, the students and require students to participate in religious prayer. And there's a case brought by uh, Catholic families in New York against 
New York State, which was compelling everybody to participate in a, in a Protestant prayer. I still have colleagues in uh, the House of Representatives today who blame Engel versus Vitale for the moral downfall of America, and they get up and they say, you know, ever since the Supreme Court in 1962 banned prayer in the public schools, you know, everything uh, has fallen apart. But I quickly remind them that the Supreme Court did not ban prayer in the public schools as long as there are pop math quizzes, there will be prayer in the public schools. Anybody can pray whenever they want. All that was forbidden by the Supreme Court was compulsion by the school over the students to participate in specific religious prayers dictated by the schools. And, and that case is a good example of the jurisprudence that has emerged um, over the centuries. Um, in any event, these principles with freedom of speech and freedom of assembly, freedom of press, and the right to petition for redress of grievances, so these are the six rights contained in the First Amendment, they establish a freedom of mind, a freedom of consciousness in American life that has been a great motor force for the development of science and reason and understanding the arts and literature and all forms of uh, invention and creativity. Um, now, the separation of powers also assign different functions to the three branches of government, as everyone knows. Um, the legislative branch is the lawmaking branch representing uh, the people. Um, sometimes it's said that we have three co-equal branches of government, which is an argument personally I reject, and not just because I'm a member of Congress, but uh, it's because the, if you look at Article One, first of all, Article One comes after, um, right after the preamble to the Constitution, which says, we the people in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and preserve to ourselves and our posterity the blessings of liberty, do hereby ordain and establish the Constitution of the United States. The very next sentence in Article I is all legislative powers are vested in the Congress of the United States. So you see what's happened there is the power to create the Constitution, to launch the government, to define the new nation flowed immediately into the Congress, the people's uh, branch. We didn't even have an executive uh, in the original uh, Articles of Confederation or the Articles of Association. That was added later in the Constitution just on the theory that we needed someone to keep government going when Congress wasn't in session and also to implement the laws without being um, micromanaged by uh, Congress itself. So the presidency is obviously important, but remember, you know, there are 27 sections relating to all of Congress's powers to regulate commerce domestically and internationally, to declare war, um, to coin uh, currency, uh, to regulate piracy, and on and on, and then Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, and all other powers necessary and proper to the execution of the foregoing. The Article 2, the presidency, has four short sections. The fourth section is all about impeachment, how you impeach a president, because our framers were afraid of kings and tyrants. They understood what one person could do. They put their faith into groups of people, into legislative assemblies and in crowds, not one person uh, who got uh, all of the power. The principal job of the president is to take care that the laws are faithfully executed. And if not, if they're committing high crimes and misdemeanors, then uh, there is a recipe for how you get rid of them because, um, you know, it's a lot easier for one person to go astray and to defy the rule of law than 535 people. It's not impossible for that to happen, but it's a lot harder uh, to make that happen. And of course, the, the judicial role is to um, decide on the meaning of the law, to say what the law is, as the court put it in uh, McCulloch v. Maryland, um, in particular cases or controversies that arrive at the court. So um, we all know that the Constitution's limitations from the beginning, its failure to abolish slavery uh, and to establish civic equality for everyone, its permission to the states to exclude women, the marginalization and subordination 
of African Americans and women and other minorities and Native Americans left it a deeply flawed document. The true glory of our Constitution, which you could see is wrapped up in the kernel of We the People, has been its unfolding, its expansion, and its transformation, especially after the Civil War um, and during the Reconstruction Amendments. And you could read the 17 amendments that we've added since the Bill of Rights as a chronicle of the struggle for the American people to create a more perfect union. Um, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery. The 14th Amendment said equal protection and due process. The 15th Amendment forbade race discrimination in voting. The 17th Amendment shifted the mode of election of US senators from the legislatures to the people. The 19th Amendment uh, gave us women's suffrage, doubling the number of people who could participate. The 23rd Amendment gave our friends down in Washington uh, the right to participate, at least in presidential elections. The 24th Amendment abolished poll taxes. The 26th Amendment lowered the voting age to 18. But you see, our entire trajectory of constitutional development has been towards increasing inclusion and deepening of the meanings of democracy for all of the people. And we continue to move in that direction at the same time today that we are burdened by and threatened by electoral college coups, coups directed not against a president, but by a president, against the vice president, in order to get the vice president to reject electoral college votes unilaterally from Arizona, Pennsylvania, Georgia for the first time in American history. We are bedeviled by violent insurrection corruption, and now propaganda, disinformation, lies, attacks on the very underlying pillars of democracy. My, my father used to say that democracy needs a ground to stand on, and that ground is the truth. And without the truth, it's very difficult to operate and to create the trust that we need to operate the system. We still have a lot of constitutional growing to do. We are on the verge of becoming the greatest multiracial, multiethnic, multireligious constitutional democracy that ever existed at the same time that we are in this seesaw battle to defend our basic democratic institutions, our elections, the right to vote against an authoritarian movement that none of us has ever seen before. Um, in our lifetime. Um, but Tocqueville said that in America, democracy is always either expanding and growing or shrinking. It's shriveling away. And John Dewey said that the only solution to the ills of democracy is more democracy. More democracy. And of course, we know that there's room for a lot more democracy in America. Um, for example, we don't have what most constitutions have, which is a, an affirmative, universal right of everybody to vote and to participate in government. Look at Article One of the New South Africa Constitution. It establishes that right for everyone. We don't have that. We have a ragtag sequence of anti-discrimination amendments, the 15th and the 17th and the 19th and the 23rd, but nowhere do you get that universal command, which is why we have millions of people, millions of American citizens, who are not voting and not represented at every level of government. Our friends in Washington, maybe we even have some Washingtonians here. I don't know, looks like we got a couple, yes. Um, 713,000 tax-paying, draftable U.S. citizens who are the only residents of a national capital on the planet Earth who are not represented in their parliament. Can you imagine if they told the people of Paris they could not be represented in l'Assemblée Nationale? You'd have another French Revolution on your hands. And in fact, when we in the House proudly passed legislation for DC statehood, not once but twice in the last two sessions of Congress, um, the last time I got up and I thanked the hundreds of thousands of Americans who live in Washington, D.C. for not breaking our windows, 
storming the Capitol, beating up our cops because they have a real political grievance, unlike the imaginary one that led to the riots and the insurrection um, on January 6th. Um, So we've got to vindicate the right to vote, which we know is embattled and besieged all over the country now. Uh, we're dealing with voter suppression statutes, attempts to roll back early voting, weekend voting. Georgia just made it a crime to um, pass somebody a bottle of water or um, a chocolate chip cookie while they're waiting in you know, one of those five hour lines to vote. Um, so we, we need to protect uh, the right to vote so it's not uh, subject to uh, just the meat grinder of balancing tests uh, in the court. We need it to be a fundamental right where strict scrutiny um, applies. Um, there are lots of other things that our Constitution needs. It's about time we had an Equal Rights Amendment in our Constitution. Uh, and we've got to make that happen. Um, we, we lost um, this last year the great uh, civil rights leader, Bob Moses, who was the leader of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and um, coined the phrase, uh, one person, one vote, going door to door in Mississippi. But Bob, uh, in the last couple of decades of his life, had devoted himself to the algebra project and was making the argument that math literacy is a civil rights issue and made a very powerful argument that the Supreme Court's jurisprudence rejecting the existence of a fundamental right to education, much less an equal education, um, has become a massive impediment to the success of millions of young people and kids in the country. So uh, he argued, I think very forcefully, for a, a, a new constitutional right to a first class equal education in the United States of America. Um, these are all things that have got to be on the agenda, um, but obviously they pull in a very different direction than just playing defense against the onslaught today uh, against the democratic practices and institutions that we have. Um, we have got to defend uh, democracy, an ethical vision of democracy with everything we've got, even as we continue to try to uh, reform and transform our institutions to make them even more responsive to the needs of the society. I will um, close with a, a passage from Wittgenstein that my son Tommy loved, where Wittgenstein said that um, the truth of an empirical pro proposition is whether it corresponds to reality in things in the world. The truth of, of an analytical proposition is whether it follows the laws of logic and is logically sound. But the truth of an ethical proposition is the courage with which we act to make it real in the world. That's how we will know whether our ethics are true, whether we can make it true by changing the world to conform to our moral sensibility. So um, I'll leave you with the words of, uh, of the great Tom Paine. Uh, updating the language as I must because uh, Speaker Pelosi insists that I do. Um, but pain in 1776 at the time of the revolution when people didn't know which way it was going to go wrote a pamphlet called The Crisis in Indies said, these are the times that try men and women's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will shrink at this moment from the service of their cause and their country, but everyone that stands with us now will win the love and the favor and the affection of every man, of every woman for all time. Tyranny like hell is not easily conquered, but we have this saving consolation. The more difficult the struggle, the more glorious in the end will be our victory. Let's make that victory ours. Thank you very much. And
midst of his election Rage filled and dangerous A ragtag insurrection They moved with impunity Thinking they'd make history Hate unveiled blatantly on a day Gathered on that public land, red hats, white fisted hands, to carry out what he had planned. The guards could not withstand the surging wave of violence through the halls and the balcony. The terror and the treachery of a day. Hope anew, knowing all there's still to do to forge a land for me and you from a day. This coming day. Thank you, Emma's Revolution. That was beautiful. What's the name of that song? On a Day in January. On a Day in January. So we have uh, quite a few questions, uh, Representative Raskin, as, uh, and shouldn't come as a surprise. Uh, and I want to start off by uh, asking you a question that uh, Juliana, who's here, and she's 12, who's asking you, how do you handle people disagreeing with what you might say as a political figure? Oh, well, thank you very much for that lovely question, Juliana. Um, well, the truth is I kind of welcome it. I, I like when they disagree. Um, you know, it, it forces me to sharpen my thinking and develop my arguments better. Um, I mean, I prefer if they disagree nonviolently. Uh, but as long as, you know, I, well, we can't be afraid of debate and dialogue because that's what makes democracy great. You know, sometimes people say, it's so partisan, how, you know, 
how can we get rid of partisanship? Well, there's one easy way to get rid of partisanship. You get rid of political parties. You move to a one-party dictatorship. There's no partisanship. You don't have to worry <laughs> about it, you know. Um, but I think what people are really saying is, well, can we make the, the partisanship less violent or less angry? And I'm all for that. Um, and, um, you know, the truth is that politicians know how to be nonpartisan when we want to be because, um, you know, if you call my office in Rockville, I'm here with my great district office director, Kathleen Connor, if you call us up, you've got a problem with anything, Medicare, Medicaid, VA benefits, immigration, whatever it might be, we go to work for you. I mean, we don't ask, are you a Democrat or Republican? Are you green or independent? We just say, do you live in 8th District? Because um, we have lots of people calling from outside of the 8th District because they're so good. But we're only allowed to serve our own constituents. But the point is, we know how to do that. Um, and so I do try to take that mentality to the legislative process. I mean, when I'm trying to legislate uh, for universal pre-K for three-year-olds and four-year-olds, it's not for all the three- and four-year-old Democrats in the country, right? It's for all three-year-olds and four-year-olds. It's for all the families. And, you know, we're, we're hoping that in the Build Back Better plan, we're going to get hearing cover, hearing aids and exams covered in Medicare. That's not just for people in my party. It's for everybody. So um, the main thing is parties are great in terms of articulating different agendas and getting the vote out and educating the public and so on. That's great, and we can fight like cats and dogs up until the point of the election. After the election, when we take office, we got to remember uh, what George Washington used to say, that the word party comes from the French word parti, a part. And my party is just a part of the whole, and we have to try to stand for everybody. Thank you. This questioner asks, if uh, former President Trump is found guilty of insurrection, will Congress be able to pass a resolution invoking Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, barring him from ever holding office? Well, it's a, that's a great question. I don't know who asked that one. But now, the House impeached Donald Trump uh, for, um, on, on January 13th. 2021 for inciting a violent insurrection. So he's, he was impeached for that. We brought uh, the case before the Senate um, and there was a 57 to 43 decision, which leaves us in a kind of constitutionally ambiguous zone. Uh, Trump beat the constitutional spread, the two thirds requirement by 10 votes. Uh, on the other hand, we have a majority of the Senate, 57 members, 50 Democrats, seven Republicans, um, joining with the House in a resounding bicameral, bipartisan statement of legislative fact that he committed a legislative insurrection, even though he was not convicted of it and therefore, um, you know, subject to the further penalties of losing pension and all those other kinds of things. Now, um, the questioner calls our attention to Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which says that no one who engages in insurrection or rebellion against the Union, having sworn an oath to support and defend the Constitution, shall ever again hold office, federal office or state office in the United States. Um, arguably, Donald Trump is forbidden right now because it has been established by majority vote that he engaged in insurrection and rebellion against the Union. But uh, there, you know, we don't have a test case on that. And so I suppose I would follow the logic of the question here, which is it might require another majority vote of Congress to define that the president has engaged, the former president engaged in insurrection and rebellion. Um, and then that could be followed by uh, attorneys general or citizens in the states saying this person cannot be on the ballot because he rebelled against us. And that was a provision put in the 14th Amendment by the radical Republicans, um, basically saying, if you were in office before the Civil War, um, like the, the vice president who was uh, from
from Kentucky, and you defect, you go to the Confederate side, you engage in insurrection rebellion, you can't serve for the, the Union again. Thank you. Wouldn't it make sense to enforce subpoenas using the civil rather than criminal process, immediate jail to enforce rather than lengthy cr criminal proceedings? So, um, yeah, th this question is a, is a good question. Of course, we've had success as recently as yesterday That's with right. the uh, criminal indictment handed down by the grand jury in the District of Columbia against Steve Bannon for refusing to show up, not showing up, and uh, for not turning over the documents that uh, we had subpoenaed. Um, but still, there is the civil remedy. Um, in criminal contempt, the contempt is a crime. And so by not showing up, he committed a crime on that day and can be sentenced uh, up to a year in jail for doing that. <coughs> Civil contempt is taking someone before a court and the court saying, you must comply and show up. Now, of course, you can show up and plead the fifth, say, I, I don't want to incriminate myself um, to particular questions and so on. But you've got to show up and you've got to invoke what you think is your privilege to specific Questions And, of course, uh, Bannon just blew off the entire enterprise. But in civil contempt, a court will compel you to go. And if you refuse to go, then you do go to jail. Um, but you hold the key to your own cell because you can leave as soon as you agree, you know, to comply with the subpoena. So our committee um, is well aware of both criminal contempt, civil contempt, and also our own inherent powers of contempt, Congress itself can, um, without going through a court, can order someone to testify and could theoretically uh, jail that person, or that hasn't happened in many, many decades, or fine that person. But we're aware of all these, and um, everything is on the table. This committee um, is a very uh, unified, bipartisan committee that is absolutely determined to get to the truth of what happened on January 6th to tell America the story of how this nightmare took place. So a related question, how long before the House committee releases any preliminary report or final one on the Insurrection. Well, we, we've, we've still got a long way to go. Um, I, I'm hopeful um, that we'll be able to get a report done uh, in the summertime next year, but there are, we have a lot of more uh, interviews to do, a lot more depositions, and then a lot more hearings, public hearings, so people can see exactly what happened. I mean, just to give you a, a thumbnail preview sketch of at least my thinking on it, Consider three different rings of activity that took place on January 6th. The outer ring um, was the ring of the riot. It, it began as a demonstration, a lawful protest, and it turned into a riot as the people who'd been called to Washington by Trump for um, a while of a protest were drawn into violence against the police officers. Um, that was the largest ring. That was tens of thousands of people who were part of that. The middle ring was the ring of the insurrection. And here you, you can see this is where the Proud Boys were, the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, the Aryan Nations, the Ku Klux Klan, the various militia groups, the QAnon apparatus, the QAnon followers. All of them um, understood that they were playing the role of essentially stormtroopers in a vanguard at the front of the protest to knock out the windows, to begin the attack on the officers and to turn it into a siege of the Capitol, an actual insurrection. And many of the people um, in that tier were training in a military way for January the 6th. Then, believe it or not, the scariest ring was not <laughs> that one, okay, it was the, the very central central ring, the, the smallest of them all, the ring of the coup. And this was a coup perpetrated by the president against the vice president. Um, the, Donald Trump had attempted in a whole bunch of different ways to overturn the popular vote in a bunch of states, either by getting states like Georgia in his 
uh, discussion with Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger simply defined, in that case, 11,781 votes. Just find me 11,781 votes. That's all I want. I'm in politics. That's all I want. Find me 11,781 votes. But I mean, that, that was a call for election fraud. That was a solicitation to engage in a conspiracy to commit election fraud, and it's being investigated in Georgia uh, right now. Um, he also tried to get the Department of Justice uh, to declare the election invalid. He tried to get the Pennsylvania State Legislature and other GOP-run legislatures simply to void out the popular vote and to replace Biden electoral slates with Trump-appointed uh, electoral slates in those states. But none of those things ended up working, so it all came down to Mike Pence on January the 6th when we met in joint session under the 12th Amendment and the Electoral Count Act. And the pretense here was that the Vice President had the power simply to reject Electoral College votes, send those electors back to Pennsylvania, back to Georgia, back uh, to Arizona, and then that would lower Biden's total below 270, which was the threshold of victory, kicking the whole contest into the House of Representatives for a so-called contingent election um, in the House of Representatives. And why did Trump want the contingent election in Nancy Pelosi's House? Well, there uh, we vote not one member one vote, but one state delegation one vote. And the GOP had 27 states um, uh, in its column after the election. The Democrats had 22, and one state, Pennsylvania, was split down the middle. So all they needed to do was to get Pence to do something which arguably was much less sweeping um, or extreme than things he had already done for the prior four years. Uh, but for whatever reason, Pence refused to go along. By the way, I don't think they would have gotten the 27th vote, which would be uh, Wyoming, uh, because that's where Liz Cheney is the at-large representative, but it still would have left them with 26 votes to 22 to maybe two doing something else. Um, and we came that close, that close. And at that point, of course, Michael Flynn and uh, Trump's national security team had been agitating for the uh, activation of the Insurrection Act. Uh, and they wanted Trump essentially to declare martial law in a state of siege to finally send in the National Guard, which had been withheld all day, uh, to clear everything out and to put an end to the proceedings. So the, that was very much uh, on the table. And it could have led to a civil war because, you know, my colleagues, um, Matt Gates and Jim Jordan, always say, well, you know, we have 74 million people on our side. And I tell them, don't forget about the 81 million people on the other side. And there's no reason to think that uh, those people um, are just going to allow the Proud Boys to roll all over us and steal our democracy away. This is uh, about climate change. How can Congress ethically stay largely ineffective on humanity's overshoot of Earth's carrying capacity, and what can we do about it? Well, thanks for raising it, because this is what the Build Back uh, Better package is all about. I mean, we've got universal pre-K and daycare and some Medicare stuff in there, but we also have the largest investment in uh, climate readiness and renewable energy in American history in the Build Back Better package. Um, and so this is the, really the, the, the critical thing that needs to be done. Obviously, we are in a civilizational emergency right now, and uh, after the meeting in Stockholm, the whole world is watching to see what we're gonna do. And we gotta get this legislation passed just like we got the infrastructure package done. How may the U.S. Senate be changed to represent one person, one vote? Well, I mean, that, so, um, that's a profound question because it's, of course, built into the Constitution, um, and it didn't happen by accident. It was the Connecticut Compromise. Uh, the big states um, would have the advantage in the House of Representatives where 
population is the key, but in the Senate, the big states and the small states would be equal. Um, of course, the, the proportional difference between the big states and the small states is far more dramatic today than it was when the Constitution began. And I tell you, when I went over to the Senate for the impeachment trial, I learned um, this, um, this little item, which is every Democratic senator's favorite fact, which is there are 50 Democratic senators, there are 50 Republican senators, the 50 Democratic senators represent 45 million more people than the Republican senators do because of you know New York and California and Illinois and the big states versus North Dakota and Montana and South Dakota and uh, but, it, you know, as you know from our discussion of the contingent election in the House of Representatives, there are um, more states in the Republican column than there are in the Democratic column, even though the vast majority of the people are represented by Democratic senators. So, uh, I mean, it, it would take a constitutional amendment. Um, the Constitution itself says that uh, no state shall be deprived of its equal suffrage without a constitutional amendment. So we could amend the Constitution uh, to do it if it's possible, but it's like the disease kills the cure because there are just too many states invested in the status quo to make that change. And we need two thirds vote in the House, two thirds vote in the Senate, and three quarters of the states in order to get it done, uh, unless we're gonna do uh, a constitutional convention but that reproduces the same problem. So I don't know, it's a very serious issue. I spoke to the, the GW Democrats the other day and the young people who are a great generation who understand everything we're talking about um, are a little freaked out and they said, what is it we can do? And I said, um, well, uh, I'll give you the advice that I gave the little kids in soccer, don't bunch. So not everybody needs to live in Brooklyn or DuPont Circle or whatever. <laughs> Spread out across the country. Get your best friends and move to South Carolina or Georgia or Montana or Alaska. And remember that Vermont used to be a very conservative Republican state until Bernie Sanders and the hippies got there and uh, they, they began to change everything. So <laughs> it works. Uh, the other way, of course, to do it is to, to overcome the filibuster. And uh, right. we're hoping that that's going to happen within the next few weeks. Um, so everybody say a prayer for Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema. Is democracy going to survive if we cannot hold perpetrators accountable? So will democracy survive if we can't hold perpetrators accountable? Um, well, the first thing is it's the right question when President Biden came over to talk to us um, two weeks ago in the House about uh, Build Back Better and about the infrastructure plan, um, he said, you know, he talks to the autocrats of the world. He hears from Vladimir Putin and General Xi and Duterte in the Philippines and El Sisi in Egypt and all of the dictators and bullies talk to him and they all say the same thing. He said, they say, Joe Biden, you're a nice man. You're a good man, but you are yesterday's news because democracy cannot survive in this century because of the speed of change and the speed of communications and the proximity of everything. Democracy can't work. And so Biden said to us, we've got to make democracy work. We've got to show not just that we've got the right values, but democracy can deliver for people, for the common good, for the common man and the common woman. And that's why I'm so proud of what we did on infrastructure. And I'm really proud of what we're about to pass with everybody's help with the Build Back uh, Better package. But do we have to hold people accountable? Of course, we've got to hold them uh, accountable. We can't let people get away with um, coups, attempted coups against the government. We can't let them get away with attempted insurrections against the government. There have been dozens and dozens of people uh, who have already been uh, tried and convicted and um, are facing different kinds of sentences. Um, they're, they're doing, the U.S. Attorney's Office 
to my mind, is basically doing what they do in all organized crime prosecutions. They're working their way up. So they started with people who are just uh, being charged with trespass or disorderly conduct or interrupting a federal proceeding. They just moved up, I think, to the level of violence. The first person who struck a federal officer was sentenced on Friday to 41 months um, in federal prison. You're going to start seeing a lot more um, and a lot more serious prosecutions of people for committing violence, hitting officers with steel poles, Confederate battle flags, American flags, um, spraying them in the face with dangerous uh, chemicals and, and so on, as well as uh, I'm hoping they'll get to the level of a conspiracy to commit sedition, to interfere with the federal election, to overthrow an election, and all those things. But I think we're going to see greater and greater momentum. These people have got to be held accountable. And of course, our committee um, is charged with writing a report to the American people and investigating. But we are also turning over all evidence that we have of criminal conduct that took place. People are coming forward still every single day. And I got an email right before I came here from someone uh, contacting me on behalf of a friend who has information. So the truth uh, will come out. There are um, thousands of hours worth of video that were made on that day, Facebook, Twitter, everything. We're going to get it all. And this uh, last, uh, it's more a comment, uh, in many ways uh, speaking uh, to something that many of us share, which is from uh, one of my colleagues at the UUA, Susan Leslie, uh, who wants me to convey that Jamie Raskin is a hero. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Raskin, for really taking what was suggestive, the lecture part. You know, taking it to heart and showing up prepared and giving us a real lecture tonight. That was incredible. Thank you. Thank you. For, for your thoughtful remarks, the, the, the analysis and, and how keen your analysis is in looking at these foundational documents, lifting up not just the glory and the grand, you know, the grandness of, of these amazing testaments to, to freedom and, and also lifting up the issues that are embedded in them uh, that came out because of the work of the people who worked on these documents, flawed human beings who brought forth not just their ideals, but also some of their internal inconsistencies. And the need for us to be reflecting on how we can change and transform not just these documents, but the institutions that have been born out of them in order to create this more inclusive society, the, the beloved community that Dr. King envisioned in a way that it works for all people. Thank you, thank you, we're deeply grateful. And before we close tonight, I also would like to thank all of you for being here, both in person and online, and also all those who helped with today's lecture. Uh, the, the amazing staff at Cedar Lane, our Kiplinger lecture team, Michael McCrickard and the members of the AV team who have been keeping the proceedings flowing here and on, online, our hospitality volunteers and Representative Raskin staff. Thank you. And Representative Raskin raised some things in the course of his, his remarks. 
And one of, uh, and I want to leave us with a couple of ways in which we would be able to take action. One is happening Monday, November 15th at noon, where we are invited by Reverend William Barber and members of the Poor People's Campaign, moral leaders, poor and low-income people to join at the Supreme Court for a rally and nonviolent direct action to tell Congress to pass a fully funded Build Back Better plan. And this, friends, is really important, and I hope you will join me and others on Monday at noon in front of the Supreme Court. And then on Wednesday, November 17th at 10 a.m., we're invited to join activists at the White House to call on President Biden to use the full power of his presidency to get Congress to pass the Freedom to Vote Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, and DC statehood. So I hope you'll consider joining us for that action as well. Thank you for being here tonight. For almost 70 years, Cedar Lane has been a beacon for this free religious faith, Unitarian Universalism in the Metro DC region. We have opened ourselves and have offered our services to the community freely, online and in person. And if you feel moved to be a part of this endeavor, we invite you to join us anytime and support and partner with us. We appreciate your support and for making Cedar Lane a community where love works. And I leave you with these words from the writers on the website, Enfleshed, Spiritual Nourishment for Collective Liberation. Keep close to your precious spirit and your holy skin and your brave being and your sacred imagination, the knowledge and assurance that whatever will be, whatever will become, whatever waits before us, we are capable of rising to meet it if we do so together. Together for justice, together for protection, together in solidarity, together in love practiced where and how it is needed most. May it be so. Blessed be. Gonna keep on moving forward, keep on moving forward, keep on moving forward, never turning back, never turning back. Sigamos adelante. Siempre adelante, siempre adelante, sin volver atrás, sin volver atrás. Gonna keep on loving boldly, keep on loving boldly. Keep on loving boldly, never turning back, never turning back. Amaremos con pasión, siempre con pasión, siempre con pasión. Gonna reach across our border, reach across our border, reach across our border, never turning back, never turning back.